Uh, if you are a Dallas Cowboy fan, would you please raise your hand again real quick? Okay. From what I understand, this is Redskins country. Is that true? Panthers? Okay. Well, I've heard both now, Redskins and Panthers. Both of you guys are in trouble, so it really doesn't matter. Uh, the Redskins especially. Good news for Redskins fans are... Uh, that your team is completely imploding and there should be a complete restructuring going on very soon. <coughs> I think they're on their third quarterback in four weeks. Um, but I, uh, I, when my wife was, who wishes she could be here, she can't. Uh, this is the first trip in two years she has not taken with me. Um, but when she was working out my schedule to come here, I said the only, th the only place I need to be on Sunday at 425 is in my hotel room, schedule nothing or make sure nothing is scheduled at 425 on Sunday afternoon because the Cowboys play the Packers. And if you are a Cowboys fan, then you know that Aaron Rodgers is the Antichrist. Um, and he has burned us more times uh, than I can count. And so I would kindly ask as your guest here that you would pray specifically for me and for the Cowboys tomorrow that they win because if they don't, like they lost last week against the Saints, which took me three days to get over, um, I will go home depressed. So I don't mind. I hate losing. I hate when the Cowboys lose. I hate it. But when they lose to the Packers, I really, really hate it. Okay, uh, let's talk spiritual things now. Now that we've gotten all the worldly things out of the way, it is a, it's an honor for me to be here specifically because I uh, love and respect your pastor. In fact, I told him a few minutes ago that he doesn't know this, but his name comes up regularly in my home between my wife and me. Uh, we uh, see things that he writes and we hear things that he says and uh, I've been in this for a long time and I've been preaching for a long time. Uh, I've been in church leadership for a long time. I've traveled the country backwards and forwards and been in more churches than I can count. And uh, what Scott says here at this church, at Forest Park Church, uh, is not just extremely rare, but it's absolutely true. And if the church, universal, uh, is ever going to be uh, in this generation what God designed it to be, it's going to be built on the kind of messages you all hear here every single week. So it's an honor for me to be here. Thank you not only for inviting me to be here this morning, but for sharing your pulpit with me tomorrow. Um, I want to I wanna read uh, from Philippians chapter 3. I want to start here. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, beginning, my eyes are getting really bad. I turned 47 this summer, and things are falling apart quicker than I can... Uh, quicker than I want them to, my eyes going first. Um, Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to begin in verse 3. This is, this is the Apostle Paul uh, putting forth his very, very impressive spiritual resume. Okay? When you think of uh, people from back in Bible days, the Apostle Paul stands out as someone who was, in many ways, a super saint. In fact, he w wrote half the New Testament. Um, he had an incredibly impressive spiritual resume. And he tells us what that resume is here in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. For we are the circum... No, wait, that's not it. Hold on a second. No, that is it. Let me start with verse 4. Okay, hold on. Um, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, 
I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count those things as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law or my spiritual performance, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for getting us all here this morning. We know that because you are in control of all things that no one is here by accident. Every single one of us is here by divine appointment. And that means that you have something very specific to say to each and every one of us. You know us better than we know ourselves. You know our fears. You know our insecurities. You know our secrets. You know our struggles. You know those things that we don't want anyone else to know. You know those things about us that we don't even know ourselves. And yet you've called us here this morning to remind us that you love us. That your love for us is unconditional. That your grace is amazing. That your mercy is outrageous. And that you have come to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And you have come to give to us what we could never get for ourselves. So I pray that it would be your voice that we hear this morning. I pray that you would speak to us loudly and clearly and compellingly, that you would overpower our unbelief, that you would comfort us where we need to be comforted, and that you would remind us that we live our lives under a banner that reads, it is finished. So fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, one of my favorite Muhammad Ali stories, and I have a few, but one of my favorite Muhammad Ali stories is a story about Muhammad Ali traveling somewhere on an airplane, and uh, the pilot comes over the loudspeaker and says, uh, we're getting ready to experience some pretty serious turbulence. Would all passengers please fasten their seatbelts? And so the flight attendants were walking up and down the aisle, checking to see if the passengers were fastening their seatbelts. And one flight attendant came on to Muhammad Ali and said, who, who had not fastened his seatbelt, and said, sir, would you please fasten your seatbelt? And Muhammad Ali responded in typical Ali fashion and said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she looked at him and said just as quickly, Superman don't need no airplane either. Please fasten your seatbelt. Um, if, if life teaches us anything at all, it teaches us that none of us are supermen. We are all broken people living in a broken world with other broken people. Now, uh, some of you may know this and some of you may not, but I used to be a successful pastor. I am a pastor today, again, for the first time. My wife and I moved to uh, just north of West Palm Beach, Florida, uh, which is where I'm from. I'm from Fort Lauderdale, but we moved to West Palm Beach, Florida uh, back in May at the request of a group of people to start a church, but I had been out of pastoral ministry for almost four and a half years. Um, but I, I used to be a successful pastor for many years. I was leading a large, well-known church, I was writing a book a year, I was on TV every week around the world, I was on the radio every day, I was traveling all over the country speaking at conferences and churches and other events. According to the world standards, I, I had everything. I had a great family, I had a successful career, I had notoriety, I had financial stability, I had influence, I had a good reputation. And then uh, it all came crashing down for me. Two things I had come to believe were secure forever were my 
21-year marriage and my career, and I lost both during the spring of 2015 due to my own sin and selfishness. My first marriage had begun to fall apart, and rather than giving it the attention that it needed, um, it ultimately ended in divorce in part because I was unfaithful to my first wife and therefore deserved to lose both my marriage and the ministry God had given me. And because I was a public person, I lost it all very publicly. Uh, this was a story. My worst moment in life was broadcast far and wide. Um, and as painful as losing those two things were, two things I thought I would never lose, uh, with those two losses came a thousand other losses. If any of you have been through a divorce, then you know that it's not just the death of one relationship, it oftentimes is the death of many relationships. Uh, families get pulled apart and friendships are divided and those sorts of things. But uh, some of those other losses for me were just those, the loss of friendships, the loss of family, but also for me, the loss of purpose. The loss of credibility, the loss of financial stability, the loss of hope, the loss of joy, the, the loss of opportunity, the loss of life as I knew it. Uh, life went from feeling like a dream to feeling like a nightmare overnight. In fact, in one fell swoop, at least it felt like this, in one fell swoop, everything and everyone that had played a significant part in my life for 41 years was gone. I broke my own life. I broke my own family. I broke the hearts of people who loved and trusted me, and I wanted to die. Literally wanted to die. I'm in the middle of seven children and uh, come from an amazing family. Um, and my mom nicknamed me Sunshine when I was a kid, which is not a very cool or masculine nickname. But she nicknamed me that because she said, every time you walk in the room, you brighten everything up. I've just always loved the sights and sounds and smells of life. I've always been an extrovert. I've always been a people person. I've always loved life. And now, at least then, when I was 42 and all this stuff happened, for the first time in my life, I felt an overwhelming sense of depression and darkness. I, I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I was absolutely convinced in my head and in my heart that my best days were behind me, that I would never again experience the joy and the happiness and the energy of life the way that I had before. Uh, I was in the slough of despond in many, many ways, and I could not envision ever getting out. Um, and I had never struggled uh, up until that point with any kind of suicidal thoughts. I mean, that just wasn't my makeup uh, internally. That's just not something I struggled with. I had friends and family members who had struggled with that, but not me. I hadn't. Uh, this was the first time in my life that death seemed preferable to life. And there was not a day that went by for almost 18 months that at some point during the day I would not think about how to kill myself or how much relief I would experience if I did. That's how, that's the kind of darkness uh, that I was in. And I have spent a lot of time over the last four and a half, five years reflecting on that very dark season. And one of the things that I've discovered is that we typically don't know how deeply we depend on things to make life worth living until those things are gone. So I didn't realize it at, at the time, but my value, my security, my deepest sense of who I was, my identity was anchored to things like my success, my reputation, my position, my friends, my, my ability to lead, the, the praise I received, the opportunities I had, and so on and so forth. And because of this, when those things were gone, I didn't just suffer grief and pain and shame and regret. I began to suffer a severe identity crisis. Without all of these things that I had, and people that I had built my identity on, 
I was 42 years old and had no idea who I was. No clue. Without these things and without these people that I had depended on to make me feel valuable, to make me feel important, I no longer knew who I was. I, I felt dead, therefore I may as well be dead. That was what was going on inside of me. And um, during that season, I had some people come alongside of me, some friends come alongside of me that were incredibly instrumental. Uh, most of the people in my life scattered. They ran. Someone once said many years ago, and I found it to be true back in 2015, um, it's almost impossible to know who your friends are when you're at the top. But when you're at the bottom, and the only thing you have to offer is leprosy, and liability to people, you discover pretty quickly who your friends are. And thankfully, I had a couple, a couple, a couple of older, seasoned Christian men uh, who came alongside of me and who uh, ministered to me in my darkest, worst moments. And these are, these are people, and if you've, been, if you've ever been in any kind of free fall, you know that things typically get worse before they get better. Um, and at least for me, because I was undergoing this massive identity crisis, the first year after my crash and burn, I spent all of my energy trying to salvage everything that I had lost. I was trying to recover what was familiar because life seemed so unfamiliar. And so I was saying whatever I needed to say and doing whatever I needed to do just to get everything back. I was manipulating the narrative and telling half-truths to the people that were closest to me and um, literally in survival mode doing everything I could simply so that I could get my former identity back. Well, oftentimes God loves us too much to give, to give us our old idols back, and so he did not allow that to happen. But it was during that season of telling half-truths and manipulating the narrative and all of that stuff that these people came closer. I did everything that I could to push them away, to push them away, and they kept moving in closer. Well, one of those men was a man by the name of Paul Zoll, who is a uh, retired Episcopalian priest uh, who's been like a father figure to me for many, many years. And when I was at my lowest and I was at my absolute worst, wanting to throw in the towel and completely give up, he said something to me, and as a result of him saying this to me, a flicker of light went off inside. He said the purpose behind the suffering you are going through is to push you into a new freedom from false definitions of who you are. I'm gonna, I'll say it again. I had to read it like two or three times when he sent it to me. The purpose behind the suffering you are going through is to push you into a new freedom from false definitions of who you are. See, I, I didn't, one more time, yes sir. The purpose behind the suffering you are going through is to push you into a new freedom from false definitions of who you are. See, I, um, I didn't struggle with the reasons why I was suffering. I knew why. I knew what I had done. I knew that I was the one who imploded my own life and the lives of people around me and suffered uh, with a tremendous amount of guilt and shame as a result of it. My, my issue was not wondering why I was suffering. And what's so interesting to me is um, the church or the Christian community in general um, it does not have a problem reminding you of why you're suffering, okay? They do that very, very well. Um, you will never lack for people reminding you why you're suffering if you've made foolish decisions and you have tanked your life and perhaps the lives of those around you. Um, 
Christian people tend, not all, thank God, but many tend to be uh, prodigious reminders of uh, our why we're suffering because of the things we've done. Um, and uh, so I didn't struggle with why. I was struggling with whether or not there was a purpose behind it. Whether or not God could or would do anything good. Whether he would bring life out of all of these deaths that I had experienced. And so when Paul said that to me, the purpose behind the suffering you were going through is to push you into a new freedom from false definitions of who you are. Uh, he was on to something deep for me. Because he had spent enough time with me to know that the reason I was suffering was because of foolish choices. But the purpose behind it was that God was setting me free. He was setting me free from uh, idolatry. He was setting me free from these false definitions that had come to define me. He was setting me free from things that I didn't even know I was enslaved to. Uh, he was, God was uh, reacquainting me with my true identity, which I'll get into here in a second. But in order to reacquaint me with my true identity, he had to expose all of these false identities uh, that I had. So I don't, I don't know what you're going through or what you're currently losing. I don't know what your shattered dreams are. I know that because we are broken people living in a broken world, other broken people, we all have them. Uh, I don't know what you've suffered. I don't know what you're guilty of doing. I don't know your deepest fears. I don't know your insecurities. I don't know all of your secrets, thankfully. Um, and I don't know your shame. But what I do know is this. Who you truly are has nothing to do with you at all. How much you can accomplish, who you can become, what you've done or failed to do, how smart you are, what other people think of you, your behavior, good or bad, your strengths, your weaknesses, your family background, your education, how your kids turn out, the way you look, and so on and so forth. Your identity is ultimately anchored in Jesus' accomplishment, not yours, his strength, not yours, his performance, not yours, his victory, not yours, his goodness, not yours. That's who you truly are. In other words, you are not what you do or fail to do. You are what Jesus has done for you. And that sounds so basic, and it is in one sense, but it is amazingly profound because I know, at least for me and the many people that I talk to, uh, it is natural for us to locate our identity, our worth, in something or someone smaller than God's work for us. For men, it can be work, it can be reputation, it can be financial stability, uh, whatever the case may be, it can be what our peers think about us, um, but it is natural for us, extremely natural for us. It's our natural default mode as, a, as broken people to locate our identity, our sense of worth and value in things smaller than what God has done for us. And when we do that, as I did, we are putting all of our eggs in a basket that can easily be taken away. And when that basket is taken away, as it was for me, and you've built your identity on those things, you completely lose yourself. Um, and you find yourself, like me, roughly middle age, going through a massive identity crisis uh, without knowing who I was or feeling comfortable in my own skin anymore. Um, so this idea that you are not what you do or fail to do, but you are what Jesus has done for you, um, is unbelievably liberating. Uh, because one of the things that this means is that because Jesus was strong for you, you're free to be weak. Because Jesus was extraordinary, 
you're free to be ordinary. Because Jesus won for you, you're free to lose. Because Jesus succeeded for you, you're free to fail. I said that last line a number of years ago uh, at a conference that I was speaking at where there were you know, a couple thousand college students, um, you know, because Jesus succeeded for you, you're free to fail. When I was finished, one of the chaperones, adults who were there, uh, came up to me, not happy at all, and said, you just encouraged you know, 2,000 young, impressionable college students to fail. And I said, okay, time out. First of all, I didn't encourage anyone to fail. All of these kids were failing just fine before I said a word, number one. <laughs> number two, I wasn't encouraging failure. I was acknowledging that we all fall short of God's glory, that we are all falling short and failing in a thousand different ways every single day, and that because of what Jesus has done for us, our failures do not ever tempt God to leave us or forsake us. Because God's love for you and his acceptance of you has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with what Jesus has already accomplished for you. Which is why in Romans chapter 8, uh, the Apostle Paul both begins and ends that chapter with some mind-blowing, heart-warming words. He says at the beginning, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not if you clean up your act and if you start crossing your T's and dotting your I's and if you start saying no to the things that I've told you to say no to and yes to the things I've told you to say yes to, then and only then will I not condemn you. Remember the woman caught in adultery? John chapter 8, and the religious leaders bring this woman to Jesus, drag her out of her bed where she was with another man, drag her into the city center, throw her before Jesus, and say, uh, what should we do with this woman? The law says we should stone her. Trying to trick Jesus, you know. They were always trying to trick Jesus because they, they believed that Jesus was sweeping God's standards under the rug which is not true. In fact, he was elevating God's standards in their minds uh, or for them by saying things like, you've heard it said that uh, if you don't get, if you don't murder anybody, you're doing just fine. But I tell you, if you've ever been angry with your brother before God, you're just as guilty. Or you've heard it said that if you don't commit adultery, you're doing just fine. But I tell you, if you've ever lusted in your heart for a moment, you are just as guilty before God. So he was always saying things like, the standard is perfection. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And he didn't say those kinds of things to inspire us to achieve perfection. He said those kinds of things to expose how imperfect we are and how desperately we need someone perfect on our behalf, namely Jesus. The law always does that. The law always exposes us as being far smaller, far weaker, and far more needy and desperate than we like to think we are. But that's when the good news of God's substitutionary work in the person of Jesus begins to warm our hearts and set us free. Um, and, so, um, and so Jesus, you know, they, pull, they throw this woman out uh, in front of Jesus and say, you know, what do we do? And uh, Jesus writes something in the sand. Uh, and the Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote. But what's interesting to me is I was studying this passage a number of years ago, John chapter 8 passage. What was interesting to me is to look back in the Bible at other times in which God wrote with his finger. And there's only two times the Bible says that God wrote something with his finger. The first is the Ten Commandments that he wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger on the two tablets of stone. The second time that God wrote with his finger was at a party where Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, was, and he was throwing this party, and a, a hand shows up out of nowhere, some hand from the sky, and starts writing on the wall. 
And Belshazzar is a little bit, you know, taken aback by this. He thinks he may have had a bad hit of acid, and he's seeing a hand out of nowhere. He's delusional. And uh, so he calls in Daniel, and Daniel interprets what it says. And what it essentially says was, you have been found, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Both times, God in the Bible wrote with his finger, he wrote law. He wrote something that would expose our sin and our need and our desperation. So we can safely assume that when Jesus, in John chapter 8, knelt down and wrote something with his finger in the sand, it was something to expose the the religious leaders who dragged the woman there. Why? Because they all left. So whatever he wrote uh, certainly exposed them. And then, of course, he says... Uh, you who are without sin cast the first stone. And interestingly, it says, and beginning with the oldest, they dropped their stones and walked away. And that caught my eye when I first looked at it many years ago because I thought, hmm, I wonder why it includes that phrase beginning with the oldest. And here's why I think it does. Um, Older people have lived longer. They've lost. They've suffered more. And they tend to be more realistic about life. Younger people tend to be much more idealistic. We have a heightened view of ourselves because we haven't crashed and burned enough. We haven't suffered enough. We haven't lost enough. As life goes on, one of the things it teaches you, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is that none of us are supermen. And so beginning with the oldest, they dropped their stones and walked away. And what does Jesus say to the woman? Woman, where are your accusers? Is there anyone left? And she says, no. And he says to her in this order, of wording is so important. Neither do I condemn you. Now go leave your life of sin. Not go leave your life in, of sin. Check back with me in six months as your accountability partner. And then if you've done well, I won't condemn you. That's not what he says. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. Well, Paul says in Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no addendum there. There are no footnotes. There's no checklist that you and I have to check off in order to get the no condemnation verdict. That verdict was secure for us the moment Jesus announced from the cross, it is finished. And then at the end of Romans 8, uh, the Apostle Paul ends with those uh, mind-blowingly liberating verses that there is nothing that can separate you from God's love. Nothing in heaven, nothing on earth that can separate you from God's love. Why? Because God's love has nothing to do with you what you do or what you fail to do, it has everything to do with what Jesus has done for you. So nothing we do or fail to do will ever tempt God to leave us or forsake us. We can never ever out the coverage of God's forgiveness. That while our sin reaches far, his grace reaches infinitely further And that has nothing to do with my performance, your performance, or the lack thereof. It has everything to do with Jesus' performance for us. And so, um, so when I say things like, because Jesus was strong for you, you're free to be weak. Because Jesus succeeded for you, you're free to fail. Because Jesus won for you, you're free to lose. Um, What that means is that your identity is firmly established and forever secured. Not because of what you do or what other people think about you or your accomplishments or uh, how well your kids turn out or whatever the case may be. It has everything to do with what Jesus has done for you. Now, here's something else that I've learned. Um, When it comes to the things that matter most, success is far more dangerous than failure far more dangerous. Um, When it comes to the things that matter most, success is far more dangerous than failure. Success made me cocky. 
Failure gave me compassion. Success made me proud. Failure gave me much needed humility. Success made me think I was big. Failure made me realize just how small I actually was. Success made me trust me. Failure made me trust God. Success brought me fans, but failure brought me friends. Um, Success connected me with people, but failure connected me to people in ways that I had never been connected before. Um, Bottom line is success made me a slave and failure is what God used to set me free. Free from the burden of believing that I had to succeed in order to matter. I mean, one of the reasons I was so hesitant to start this church that my wife and I just recently started, I had been out of pastoral ministry for four and a half years, and when this group came to us, I was uh, intrigued, I was honored, I was curious, but I was extremely reluctant. And there were a few reasons for my reluctance, but one of the reasons I was reluctant was because Uh, There is no part of me that wants to go back to being what I used to be. And I was fearful that this could be step one into me becoming what I used to be. Uh, And one of the things that in the process of thinking and praying about this possibility of relocating and starting this church, one of the things that God taught me was that there is no going back to who you used to be because I put that person to death. Death and resurrection is the rhythm of the Bible. It's the rhythm of our lives. We are constantly dying and being raised to life constantly. We're, we're dying to things each and every day. There are dreams that are dying. There are relationships that are dying. There are hopes that are dying. There are uh, people that are dying. Um, all of those things we're experiencing, and there can be no real life apart from death. Um, success made me a slave. Failure set me free from the burden of believing that I had to succeed in order to matter. Um, That is a struggle for humanity at large, but it's a struggle for men in particular. Uh, We have been told in a thousand different ways, and all too often, thankfully that's not the case here, but all too often the church perpetuates the same message that in order for men to be men, we need to be successful. You need to be an amazing husband. You need to be an amazing father. You need to be an amazing provider. Um, You need to be, in many ways, flawless. It always bothered me that Mother's Day sermons we're always glowing about the mother, you know? I mean, mothers were honored, they stood up, they gave them flowers, it was like, oh, we, we bow to you, okay? Father's Day sermons were always the pastor standing up and chiding men for being deadbeat dads and you need to date your wife and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, my gosh, man, you know? Um, I resolved from the moment I became a preacher that if I ever, and I don't do Mother's Day sermons and Father's Day sermons, but if I ever did, Um, I was going to tell both mothers and fathers, cheer up, you're a lot worse off than you think you are, but God's grace is infinitely greater than you could ever ask for or imagine. Um, But the church tends to be, uh, tends to perpetuate this idea that if men are going to be men, godly men, um, you know, we have to have lust in check, greed in check, we have to give ourselves, you got to do the dishes, and you got to give yourself entirely to your wife and your children, and this, and we all fail at that. It's not that we shouldn't do those things. Uh, We all fail at that, and um, most marriages I know uh, are not nearly as healthy as the people in that, those marriages want us to think that they are. Um, there's a lot of disappointment, a lot of tension, a lot of relational strain, uh, a lot of just simply cohabitation going on, uh, and we fake it 
in the Christian community. We put our masks on and we fake it because uh, we fear rejection if people think that we're not pulling it off the way we're being told to pull it off. Um, failure at anything will set you free from believing that you have to succeed in order to matter, which is why success is far more dangerous than failure. Um, uh, let me just conclude with this. Most of the people that I meet these days are, are people like me. I have, not, um, let's see, fall of 2017, so two years ago now, um, I, uh, I started writing about everything that had happened in my life a couple years earlier and writing very honestly, very openly, very transparently. Uh, I was brutally honest uh, in talking about my own sin and the way that God's grace showed up in my worst moments and in my worst places. And I started publishing these things um, on my website and the response was overwhelming. I, my wife and I had no idea how people would respond to this, but the response was overwhelming from literally all over the world. Uh, people were writing in, telling me their own crash and burn stories, their own struggles. I could tell you stories that would make your jaw hit the ground of pastors, people who used to be pastors, people inside the church, people outside the church um, who we're dealing with struggles or sins or whatever the case may be, guilt, shame, whatever the case may be, and didn't have anyone to tell. Uh, and even though all of their stories were different, circumstantially, they all basically said the same thing, that the Christian community is the scariest rather than the safest place for fallen people to fall down and broken people to break down. Um, at some level, every single one of these people felt unsafe inside the Christian community, taking off their mask and sharing their struggles and sharing their secrets. And so most of the people that I meet these days are people like me, people who live with guilt and shame and regret because of what they've done, people who would do anything to go back in time and make different choices but are presently plagued knowing that they can't, people who fear they will never hope again, people who endure the painful void of broken relationships, people who struggle with believing that anybody, even God, could love them because they've screwed up so many times. Those are the kinds of people that I hear from and the people that I talk to and the people that I meet. Um, and what's sad to me is that most people assume that Christianity is for good people rather than good news for bad people. That's what most people assume. Uh, that the church is where the good people go. The bad people are out there. I mean, look at you guys, it's Saturday morning, you know? I mean, you could be doing a thousand different things, and where are you? You're in church with a bunch of men talking about God. You know, you're the cream of the crop, okay? That's kind of what I grew up believing for whatever reason. No one ever said that to me, but I kind of grew up believing that um, Christians were the good people in society, and church was where the good people gather. The bad people are out there. The good people are in here. Um, but what's very sad and false about that is that Christianity is good news for bad people. It's not good advice for good people because the fact of the matter is that God loves and uses bad and weak people who fail because bad and weak people who fail are all that there are. I mean, wherever I go, I say the same line. Somewhere in what I say, God loves bad people because bad people are all that there are. When Jesus said, uh, I've not come for the righteous but for the sinner, some people assumed in his day that Jesus was distinguishing two kinds of people. There were good people who did not need him and there were bad people who desperately did. And uh, Jesus was not saying that at all. He was saying that there were two kinds of people. He said, he was saying that there are, there are bad people who think that they're good, and there are bad people who know that they're bad. But there's no such thing as a good person. The bad people who think that they're good won't listen to me because they don't think they need me. It's the bad people who know that they're bad 
who hear my voice. Which is why uh, the scandal of the religious leaders were the people who flocked to Jesus. These were the moral and spiritual outcasts of the day. Uh, These were people who had no business with God at all. Because God was all about rule keeping and ladder climbing. And these people were terrible at it. Which is why Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, As it pertains to ladder climbing and rule keeping, I was the best of the best. And it meant nothing. Um, so these people that I talk to, I, I feel compelled to remind them that while we can never go back to a past that we have lost or ruined, we can always go to God. A God who promises to use people who fail because there aren't any other kinds of people. A God who has forgiven and forgotten the sins of our yesterdays, todays, and tomorrows, a God who does not remember the sins we cannot forget. That's what Hebrews 8.12 says. And I will remember their sins no more. I have down this arm right here, I have a tattoo uh, that has the words, one line to one of my favorite hymns, Uh, and the line goes like this. Well, may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them well and thousands more. My God, he knoweth none. Well, may the accuser roar, and he does. You know it. You know inside. I mean, the the guilt and shame um, and regret that all of us have at some level is there. For some of us, it's more acute. For others, it seems a bit more distant, but it's there. Well, may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them well and thousands more. My God, he knoweth none. One of my favorite lines from Martin Luther uh, is when he said, when the devil reminds me that I am a wretched sinner, he does me a favor Because Jesus died for wretched sinners. (laughs) Um, I think that that's something that we all too often forget in our lives, uh, inside the church. Um, we, we, We forget that this God who has... Uh, covenanted to love us does so on the basis of what Jesus has done on our behalf. Not because we earned it, not because we deserve it, not because we can get any more of it, but because of what Jesus has done. So I I remind these people, as I remind you, that um, God has forgiven and forgotten the sins of your yesterdays, todays, and tomorrows, um, that he does not remember the sins you cannot forget. Um, I remind them of a God who won't stop pursuing us no matter how far or fast we run because we can never, ever, ever, as I said before, out the coverage of God's forgiveness, ever. Um, I remind them of a God who will never stop pushing us into the freedom of being nothing so that Jesus might be everything for us. So, Uh, If I were to title this talk, it would simply be Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And everything minus Jesus equals nothing. Um, I wrote a book by that title in 2011 and had no idea what was going to (laughs) happen. Had no idea that this book entitled Jesus plus nothing equals everything uh, would soon be put to, to the test in my own life in a very profound way. I jokingly tell some of my closest friends, I'm like, you know, I've, I think I've got it wrong because, um, you know, 
Joel Osteen writes books about being uh, rich and happy, and he's rich and happy. And I write books about suffering and losing, and I suffer and lose. Like, I think there needs to be a massive shift in my strategy here. Uh, <laughs> like, I'm, <laughs> I need to go to Houston and take some notes. <laughs> um, but uh, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. It's not some theological tagline. Uh, it is my functional lifeline uh, these days in ways that it never has been. And uh, if I were to encourage you at all this morning, uh, it would simply be by way of reminder. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said that, uh, speaking about children, children need to be reminded more than they're taught. And his point was, they need to be reminded of who they already are and what they already have. That's something we forget oftentimes. Uh, we, we have amnesia when it comes to the radical grace of God and what he's already accomplished on our behalf. So regardless of where you are or what you're struggling with or where you might be, you know, if your understanding of the Christian faith does not have room for the fact that your greatest failure may be in front of you, scrap it, okay? Um, that's scary, I know. Um, I said that exact line almost six months to the day before I fell on my face. That if your understanding of the way God relates to us does not have room for the fact that your greatest failure may be in front of you, then you're reading the Bible wrong. Because as we'll see in the next session, uh, I'm gonna look at Psalm 51. And as we'll see in that session, um, for many people, our greatest failures happen after a saving encounter with God, after. And if we don't have, I think the only reason, the only reason I did not completely lose my faith in the wake of my cataclysmic fall and loss is because everything I'm telling you now is what I actually believed before. And if I had embraced some other version of the Christian faith, some do more, try harder, get better, God gives gold stars to well-behaved kids version of Christianity, um, I would have realized that uh, I was not worthy, I was not qualified, and therefore God couldn't love me. Um, so uh, unconditional love is what God gives, it's what God bestows, it's what God offers, not because of who you are, but because of what Jesus has done. Let me, uh, let me pray real quick. God, I pray that you would massage this truth deep into our bones and use it to set us free. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.